Professor Stephen Hawking takes the stage to give a lecture about time to a packed auditorium. In the audience is a curious mix of both physicists and devoted fans. Can you hear me? He's so famous. Everyone, when you think of physics, you automatically think of Stephen Hawking. What he says, they're like pearls that drop now because everyone's on the edge of their seat waiting to see what this great mind is going to share with us again. His book, A Brief History of Time, was a record-breaking bestseller. It has made him the greatest science superstar since Albert Einstein. The possibility to see somebody like Einstein speak, I don't think anybody would pass up. He is the number one celebrity physicist for me. People like the idea of, of him being uh, the, the great mind in the crippled body and this, this image of him speaking some kind of ultimate truth. And I think Stephen, because of his condition, not, not his fault of course, but because of his condition, he is treated rather in this way as, as some kind of oracle. All over the world, people want a hero of science, like Einstein was. My ambition was to understand the universe, not to be famous. But is Hawking's status as the greatest mind since Einstein really just a product of hype and public sympathy? What actually lies behind this image of modern-day genius? People sort of think of Hawking as having been created at the way he is today. He wasn't. He was, he was normal at first. Stephen William Hawking was born on the 8th of January 1942 in Oxford. The eldest child of middle-class educated parents, he grew up in an unconventional and intellectual family. He was extremely talkative as a child. In fact, can have stopped but he didn't learn to read very early. I think because I told him stories, his father read him stories, so he didn't really see any need. His sisters were much quicker at reading than he was, and I don't think he would have passed all these tests that people pass, because we were never really very conscious of that sort of thing in our household. His father, Dr. Frank Hawking, was a medical scientist and travelled the world researching tropical diseases. He encouraged his son's curiosity about the world around him. It wasn't very long before he and his father were lying on the grass in the garden, looking up through a rather old-fashioned telescope at the stars and the moon. His father was very inspiring in a lot of ways, and uh, he just led him into that sort of thing. But I don't think he needed much leading, it was just natural to him. By the age of ten, Hawking already knew he wanted to be a scientist and find out how the universe worked. His curiosity extended to his childhood hobbies. He liked designing complicated Meccano models for him and his friends to build. He later said they were an early exercise in figuring out how things worked and how to control them. While Hawking relished the challenge of working things out for himself, conventional lessons left him cold. He went to a minor private school in St Albans, where at first it was his appearance rather than his performance that made him stand out. Well, he was a small, untidy boy. Yes, with a somewhat large and ungainly head in proportion to the rest, I suppose. And he did quite often look gangling, uh, as if his joints weren't quite tightly connected, so he would sort of flop about a bit. His speech was called by uh, somebody Hawking Ears because it did rather resemble his father's rapid machine gun delivery combined with a bit of a stutter. 
I think in terms of ordinary academic achievement at school, he wasn't regarded as particularly clever and never did very well in exams. All right, but not very well. For one thing, his handwriting was execrable. And for another thing, he just is not and was not competitive. He, I remember once, when I, I think almost his first year at St Albert's School, he was pretty near the bottom of the group. He was in the aid stream. And I said, oh, can't you do a bit better than that? And he said, well, some other people have done worse. <laughs> he really did not care. But when he was interested, Hawking worked hard. At the age of just 16, he and his school friends designed and built a computer. It worked. If you asked it the right questions, it gave you the right answers. It was made out of all sorts of spare parts from old machines and toasters and things like this. Inevitably, Hawking's innate abilities eventually pulled him to the top of the class. His final report was glowing. Following in his father's footsteps, he applied to University College Oxford. He went up in 1959, aged just 17, to read physics and mathematics. But study was the last thing on his mind. Most of the people in his year were older than him, having done national service. The boyish Hawking seemed to have some catching up to do. My first memory of really talking to Stephen was when Gordon Berry, another of the physicists in my year, and I went to find Stephen um, to catch some coffee from him after dinner. And Stephen was sitting there with a, a crate of beer, um, drinking his way through it. At the time, of course, he was only 17. He couldn't even go into a pub legally. Um, and we had a very pleasant evening with him. What he looked like most of the time he was up, really, was rather messy, um, untidy, a bit not, not really clean, um, though he may have been. But this is the impression he gave, hair too long and that sort of thing. I met him in college at parties. And, of course, he liked drinking, and I always used to go and talk to Stephen at the beginning of parties because it was better value, really, to do so. Hawking's social life wasn't confined to drinking. He was a member of his college rowing club, Coxing the Second Eight. His aggressive, competitive style made him a popular member of the team and always worth watching. I remember running along the towpath because he was very exciting, Cox. A lively figure. Being in the boat club helped him a great deal because he was respected for his ability as a cox, a member of the gang, as it were. <laughs> Stephen never really did very much in the way of work. Um, it was an era in which a number of people didn't do a great deal of work, but Stephen was outstanding in not doing anything and got away with it because, of course, he was so intelligent. I once calculated that I did about 1,000 hours work in the three years I was at Oxford, an average of an hour a day. I'm not proud of this lack of work. I'm just describing my attitude at the time. Hawking's laid-back attitude masked his formidable intellect. His fellow students got their first inkling of this when they were all set some particularly difficult coursework. It was chapter 10 of Bleeny and Bleeny, which was a chapter on waves. And Richard and I, working together, managed to do one whole question. We'd spent all week on it. Stephen hadn't even looked at them. With only a few hours to go before the deadline, Hawking sat down at his desk and looked at the questions for the first time. Down came Stephen. And so I said, well, Hawking, how many have you managed to do then? Because there were 12 questions there. And he said, well, he said, I only had time to do the first 10. And so we all started laughing. And he just looked at us quizzically. And we realised that he had actually done the first 10 questions. And I think at that point, 
we realised that it wasn't just that we weren't in the same street as Stephen, we weren't on the same planet. 